Hello, and welcome back to the Growth Circle Podcast. I'm your host, Lincoln Amstutz, and today I've got a great guest on, Savannah Shepard, and I'm about to bring her on the podcast here, a little bit about her beforehand. Uh, Savannah is a wildly accomplished young professional in the retail and investment real estate space in Southwest Florida. She had a history of working in sales, which gave her a great foundation to build her real estate career which she started when she got her real estate license at age 18. After working in real estate for over four years, Savannah decided to open her own brokerage, Self State Vision Realty. She now has 25 agents within the brokerage and has opened a second office in June of this year. Savannah has had the privilege and opportunity to help hundreds of families find or sell their dream homes and bring investors residential and commercial properties for their portfolios. So without without further ado, I invite Savannah on the podcast. Welcome to the Growth Circle Podcast, Savannah. Hi, Lincoln. I'm excited to be here today. Yeah, yeah. Good to have you. Good to have you. Well, right off the bat, I just wanted to to start by saying, you know, you found success in both selling houses on your own over the years and in building a highly successful brokerage with a couple dozen agents now, all in your early 20s. Uh, What got you motivated to jump into real estate? And what has it been like being a younger professional in this space? You know, it's been interesting. I've enjoyed uh, most of it. (laughs) Um, I would say what got me into it is right away when I was looking at what career path I wanted to take, I knew a couple things about me that I love business, I love people, and I love sales. So I was looking at saying, am I going to college? And if I'm going to college, I want to know why. So what am I going to? I I wasn't content with making that decision while I was in college. Or um, am I not? In what career path am I going to take? So I tried a couple of different things. I did a couple of small businesses of my own. And I realized I didn't want to do any sort of online business because I like the people interaction. Mm. So I went to furniture sales and thought maybe I would purchase a furniture store, work on the sales side, and then I still have people interaction. But I did not like it didn't have as much of the business side that I really love. It still felt like you were in a box with people in sales, but you were still in a box. Um, And then someone mentioned to me, it was actually my dad who mentioned, he's like, you know, you would make such a great real estate agent. And we grew up in real estate. He was flipping properties while we were younger, so it wasn't a completely foreign idea. So when he mentioned that, I was just like, "That, that's it. That is exactly what I need to do. It fits my business that I love. It fits the people that I love and the sales side. Those are the three big things. And um, uh, yeah, so I jumped into it and ever since then, I mean, I love it so much. Every aspect about it it was the absolute best move for me. So yeah, yeah, I, I'm very excited to be where I am. As far as being young, I can tell you it's been so interesting and exciting to watch. When I first got into real estate, it was back in 2016, and I was the baby. <laughs> there was nobody. I mean, obviously, I was as young as you could be because I was 18. So it's not like anyone could be younger than me, aside from you know months or days. So, But at the same time, Everyone, I mean, I'm here, you said Southwest Florida. I mean, I'm in Southwest Florida. So everyone here is much older. And in this industry, the average age is probably in their 60s. So it is much, much older. But when I first got into real estate, again, I there were no agents my age whatsoever. As the years have gone on, it's been exciting and interesting to see that there's quite a few more young Asians that are getting into real estate and and doing well and succeeding at it. So it's it's a very exciting. I have a lot more young agents. I mean, my brokerage, there's a lot of young agents at my brokerage and a lot more agents in our community that are younger. And, you know, it, it wasn't because of me, but it's just interesting to see how, how they have started to come in, whereas there was nobody beforehand. Right, right. I mean, and that's like you're saying, it's very different for maybe the industry, especially that area, just to be younger in the space. Do you feel like that, uh, helped you in a lot of ways in, in the quick growth that you had? Or do you think it was just simply you showed up and you worked each day and the age was, you know, is maybe a piece of it, but not necessarily? Um, and then- you know, I would say it actually hurt me being young because a lot of people, I mean, you show up to someone's largest investment 
that they have, that they own. Most of most people, their home is their largest investment, their largest asset. So you as an 18 year old show up and say, oh, I can sell your house. You know, here's why you should work with me. Here's what I'll do for you. Um, that's difficult. And I had, I remember a lot of times where people, they didn't necessarily, I will tell you, I did not advertise my age whatsoever because of that. I know everyone does it differently. I did not advertise my age. I tried to look so much older. I was constantly in suit coats. I always had my makeup done, my hair done, high heels on, suit coats on because I wanted to look older than my age. Because again, you're walking into someone's you know, million dollar house telling them why they should work with you, whatever the price range is, is their largest investment. And they're going to look at you and you don't want them to think, you know, oh, you're a young kid. What are you doing? Am I your first sale? I did not want those questions. So I would say it hurt me. Um, the success was 100% just from working hard. It's, it's, it's not even about being the smartest person out there. It's literally about just doing the hard work and being consistent. And it, so that's why I say it doesn't matter what age or, you know, what you've got in front of you, you can do it. It's just really hard work. And it wasn't easy. I, I won't say that. My friends know when they say they want to get into real estate, I'm like, it's not easy. So it does not happen overnight. But but overall, I would say it hurt me. And I had to position myself to where I didn't look like the 18 year old. And like I say, I didn't advertise my age. And when someone would ask me, how old are you? You know, like, you look really young. How old are you? Are you still in school? Um, I would just be like, oh, you're not supposed to ask a lady her age and like kind of make a joke right. and move on. Because I didn't want them to know. As soon as they do, it's like, you're 18? Um, okay, you can't help the thoughts that you think. So, sure. Yeah, that, but yeah. And, and, you know, I like what you were saying earlier about just you getting into real estate and choosing it over another business, another career. You had your criteria of this is what I'm really looking for in in my work and what I'm going to do day to day. And then you narrowed down your search from there. And, and even your perspective on college is good of, you know, I'm not just going to go to go. If I'm going there, I want to have, you know, a plan in mind so that I'm not just spending this money and time you know, away from another opportunity. So I think that's helpful for a lot of younger people looking for what they want to do is just come up with your criteria of what um, you're looking to do um, in your career and then reverse engineer that and find the industries you're in. And and you did. And and what was some of the hard work that you had to put in up front to maybe overcome some of those obstacles? As, uh, what does that look like as a new agent? Um, what kind of work did you put in to make connections and get your leads and lists? Yeah. So it is honestly about meeting the most amount of people that you possibly can. Um, you have to be assertive. You have to. I had open houses. I had about three open houses a week. You can have even more than that. I did an open house on Friday and two open houses on Saturday. As new agents, I, I tell my agents, you need to have as many open houses as you can. You better be out there Saturday and Sunday having open houses. Friday evening, because those are buyers that are coming to you. And then you get the opportunity to get their information and start working with them. So I did a lot of open houses. My first year, 25% of my business came from open houses. 25% um, of my, or I'm sorry, 50% of my business came from door knocking. So everyone, I, I was at Keller Williams, that's where I started. And everyone teased me and they're like, you know, she's the girl that knocks the doors. But I did a lot of door knocking. And what I would do is Thursday, basically all day I was door knocking in Southwest Florida. That's not fun. Mm. It is hot. <laughs> yeah. So when I started looking like really a mess, I was like, all right, I need to stop door knocking now. But I did a lot of that. And I got, I can't tell you how much business I got. I'll give you percentages because I, I do I do like the numbers so I can give you some of that. For sure. Um, but I did get a lot of my business from door knocking. And it's just putting yourself out there. It's I don't care what you have on the piece of paper that you're going to give them. It's not about that. It's about the fact that you met me. And I get to say, you know, hi, I'm Savannah Shepard. I'm the local real estate agent here and uh, expert here in the area. And and then you have a conversation with them. Ask them something they, you know, if you ask for their knowledge, then it seems like they're helping you, right? So 
tell me, you know, you as a homeowner in the neighborhood, what are your thoughts? Do you like the neighborhood? Oh my goodness, I can't stand it here. My husband wanted to move here. I didn't want to be here. Oh, well then I guess it's good I'm, I'm at your door right now. Let me give you my card and I'll come by tomorrow and sell your house. You know, whatever. Like it didn't always happen that easy. It usually didn't happen that easy. Um, but at the same time, it did. I remember, you know, one time I was door knocking and I was so exhausted. I'm like, I just want to be done. There's one more house at the end of the street. I'm like, no, go walk to it. It's, you know, further down from all the other houses. I walked to it, knocked on their door and they're like, oh my goodness, we literally just sat on the couch and said, we need to put our house for sale. Our kids are up north and we need to move. So yeah, did you bring a listing agreement? L- literally just like that. They signed a listing agreement that day. And I was 18. That was my first listing. Um, I think that was my second listing. But so it works. Uh, don't expect that every time. There's a lot of times that you spent hours and hours and it feels like you got absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's real estate. You have to be consistent. You have to keep doing it. For my open houses, I would door knock 50 houses all around. Um, I could get about 25 doors an hour. So for someone who's trying, that's about what I would say to estimate. I did a ton of door knocking. So like I say, my first year in business, 50% of it came from door knocking. My second two years in business, 25% of my business came from door knocking. And that was um, 16 and 18 million in sales. So my my second year, I did 16 million in sales, and that was 25% door knocking. My third year, 18 million in sales, 25% door knocking. So we're not talking about one deal. I mean, we're talking about a lot of deals that, I mean, our average sale price at that time was like 250. So that's that's a lot of deals from door knocking. But those would be my biggest things is um, door knocking and open houses for people that you don't know. And then it's your sphere of influence. So your sphere of influence is whatever you're a part of. To me, if you are very involved at, you know, your local church, that that's mine. I'm very involved there. Now, I don't walk around and say, oh, let me sell your house. Let me sell your house. But people know if you have a question, I'm there for you. And because of that, they also come to me and say, hey, I do need to sell my house without me advertising it. I'm very involved there. So whatever it might it might be, you know, a golf club, whatever that might be, or it truly might just be your sphere of influence. And you're the person that's having a party every quarter at your house inviting everyone out. But you're just staying in contact with those people that you have. Um, those are the three things that I built my business off of. And the biggest thing I can say is it wasn't easy and it, you have to be consistent. Anything that I've done that I have not been consistent with, I have not um, have, have not had success. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when it comes to mailers, let me just throw this, let me try this, do that. No, none of it's worked unless I've been consistent with it. Right. That's that's just going to be the biggest determinant of, yeah, whether something works out or not is that consistency and, and persistence there. And it shows that you had that with, with the door knocking. For it to be 50%, and then 25% of, of all of your sales, I mean, that shows that a lot of time and, and door knocks were put in. And I mean, I feel like that is kind of a lost form of marketing nowadays. You know, I've got a, I got a buddy here in Springfield who wanted to get into wholesaling and he was really interested in jumping into real estate, but he tried the, the cold calling and some of these different um, online marketing methods and it's just very congested and there's a lot of people doing it. So he wasn't finding success. So he just started doing that same thing, going door to door, knocking for hours. And he's started to find some really great success and and good deals from that. And there's something about that face-to-face personal interaction that you can't really find anywhere else. And, you know, these open houses, like you're saying, and you've just got to be willing to put in the hard work because you could have went and knocked on doors all day long that Thursday. And then, like you said, that last one, was just a green light where they were ready to go sign the listing agreement and and it makes that whole day worth it. So you've you've got to be able to do that. And for you, where where did that hard work ethic come from? Because not everybody's just going out in the southwest Florida heat and and knocking on doors and being friendly, talking to people. I mean, where did that work ethic and just desire to be consistent and have a plan come from? Yeah, I mean, that's how I was raised for sure. So I remember it was funny. I had a coach my first year in real estate and he told me, he's like, you need to go door knocking. 
And again, you know, I like being with people. I'm good with the face to face versus a phone conversation. So I was like, yeah, absolutely. I can do that. And um, told me to go door hacking. I come back and I, I made a joke. I was like, Frank, which was my coach. I was like, Frank, you didn't tell me I was going to get blisters when I went door knocking for two hours. My feet are killing me. And he's like, you know what? I didn't tell you because I didn't know because I have told all of my coaching students to do that and nobody's done it. Mm. So he's like, I honestly didn't know. Obviously, the whole conversation was a little bit in jest, but for him, it was like this aha moment of I didn't know. I didn't know to tell you don't wear heels because you'll get blisters, which I know that sounds so silly, but it just goes along with your point that most people don't. I've done multiple podcasts. I've done classes. I've talked to people, uh, so many things. And it's not um, the people that I tell this to nine times out of 10, maybe even more than that, they're not going to do it. They're going to say, wow, that's so awesome. Maybe I'll do that sometime and they won't do it. Um, But when it comes to, you know, work ethic and things like that, completely how I was raised. So, um, you know, my dad is a pastor. I have 10, nine siblings. I'm the oldest of 10. So you got to be hardworking in that family with that amount of kids. And like I say, my dad is a pastor, so we didn't make a whole lot of money. So we did flips and we all worked on those flips growing up. And yeah, he built that in both my mom and my dad are, you know, uh, that that's very important to them. To them, it's, you know, you're going to be a good citizen and you're going to work hard and, um, you know, laziness is not acceptable. So they definitely put that all in us. And I'm very appreciative of that because a lot of the things that they taught us to do, you know, you put that into your business and it's just like, wow, why doesn't everyone do this? And they may not have been raised that way. So yeah, I'm very appreciative of that. Yeah. And it's clearly paid off. Not only, you, you know, have you been able to build this brokerage and team of people that now also get to have a job and are working and finding success. But, um, you know, it's also helping set you up for later on that, you know, you're putting in hard work and time and energy now. So maybe you can have some more time and, and flexibility later on um, to be able to give back even more. And, you know, that all starts from just somebody setting an example there for you. And I wanted to ask, talk, talk a little bit about your real estate team, um, the people that work in your office, uh, when did you initially bring people in to work alongside of you in the real estate uh, space and, and how has that grown? Yeah, so that's always hard. Your first hire, you know, am I making enough money to hire someone? Can they, you know, can I actually consistently pay them? It's scary. You don't never know when the right time is. Um, what I would say is when you're doing several deals consistently, you need to bring someone in. Now, nowadays, you can just hire a TC transaction coordinator and you don't have to pay her salary nothing like that she you just pay her a couple hundred dollars to do every transaction for you each individual file that would be my first suggestion and that's what i suggest my agents hire a transaction coordinator we actually have one at our brokerage because i feel like that's very important to have then you're going to hire a listing coordinator and that's the person once you have your listings she takes care of everything and basically puts it on the market for you um hires the photographer puts it on the MLS, all of those things. So that way you can get the office stuff out of your hands. Because again, as real estate agents, most of the time someone chose the real estate career is because they're good with people. While me spending 10 hours working on paperwork is not what I'm good at, nor do I want to do it. I have a headache and I feel like it was the worst day of my life. So I'd rather hire someone and give that to them. So I would say hire your transaction coordinator, your listing coordinator first, and then you're going to hire an admin. Before the biggest moneymaker is your commission. So before you start giving a piece of that pie away, you're better off just paying someone. Um, don't don't touch your commission yet. You keep your commission. You keep that money coming in. Hire an admin. She can help you with your social media. She can help you with your email. She can help you with the day-to-day task of put the sign here, take the sign down, put this lockbox here. The things that you don't necessarily need to be doing and you can take off your plate. That way you can be making more business coming in, um, come in. So those would be all my first hires. And then at some point, obviously, you know, I'm a broker now. So I, when a buyer calls me and says, hey, I want to go look at houses, I, I'm not, oh, let me go schedule them and show you them this afternoon. That's not where I can be anymore because I have quite a few different roles. So then you do have to start cutting into that pie of your commission. 
Um, first one is you can hire a showing agent and that's someone who shows the properties for you. So you're still the one, you're still their agent. You're still the one making the negotiations. You're still the one writing the contracts, but they physically show the properties for you. So I did that probably only two years into the business. I hired a showing agent. Um, it may have been three. I'm not hot. I want to say probably two. So had that for a while. That worked out great. But then I realized I have too many listings. I can't keep working with these buyers. So I need to hire a full-time buyer's agent. Now that, that's hard to find someone who's going to work really good with your clients and take just as good care of them as you would. You got to micromanage that. So I, I tell my buyer's agents, um, not so much now, but beforehand, especially like expect me to micromanage because you're taking care of my babies. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to micromanage. You have to. You do not want something to happen to one of those clients of yours and them say, well, you know, Savannah's too busy to work with me now. So we're just going to go to a different agent because the people that she hired just don't do the same job. Right. That's not what I want. So Nobody wants that. So you do have to micromanage that. Hire your buyer's agent, bring them on, um, micromanage them. Once you've got them, then from there, it's natural. You'll know when you can start hiring more. I've got four buyer's agents on my team. And, you know, at some point, it's like if someone else said, I would love to join Savannah Shepard's team. I want to be on the Savvy Realtors team. Um, and they sat in my office right now. It's no longer about me saying, oh, like, can I give them leads? Will this work? It's kind of a, a well-oiled machine. At a certain point, you just start saying, you know, okay, well then if you want to come on, here's the task that you have to complete. Here's what you have to do. And then you can come on. You know, you have to have, I have a whole list of things they have to do. They have to have a certain amount of open houses, calls, door knocking, things like that to be able to be on the team. Um, so yeah, at some point you just start to know it's like you hire the first one. It's the most difficult don't touch your commission, keep your commission, hire admin, and then you'll start going showing agent and then a buyer's agent. And then, I mean, if you really go big, then you're going to be hiring a listing agent and multiple buyer's agents. So. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah. really good. That breakdown of the order in which it makes the most sense to hire because it, at any you know, given time, if you're working hard and you're doing what you need to do to network and, and get in front of people, yeah, your time's going to fill up and you're going to be limited on the business you can take in unless you hire out and free up some of that time. So I think, yeah, that TC first, the listing coordinator, uh, you know, separating, you know, the hourly type of uh, jobs and just paying them specifically for that rather than diving straight into cutting up the commission that's a huge piece. So you can still have momentum, you're building up cash and, you know, and being able to put that back into marketing in the places that it's needed. And then when, again, your time still gets completely filled after that, then you can step into, you know, hiring those uh, listing and, and sales agents. Um, and that's just a, that's a great process. I, I know you've done some online, you know, videos and educational uh, content. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. When did that start? And is that just something that you genuinely enjoy to do? Is it something to help grow the the, the sales in your company? What's, what's that all about? So remember when I said the things that I have done that I have not been consistent with haven't worked? That's one of them. Um, you know, I was very consistent. So COVID hit. And as soon as COVID hit, I think we all looked at our businesses as entrepreneurs and said, what are we going to do? Because we can't do the thing that we want to do the most. And that's Talk, at least for me, talk face to face, go meet people, go to events, um, enlarge my world by meeting these people. I, you can't do that anymore. None of that exists. So how do we correlate that to our business and not make our business take a hit for that? So I went into a lot more social media. So every week on Wednesday, I did a, um, a video and I called it my Real Talk channel. I do still have it. I'm actually making some later on today. But and I would we every week go out with them. So I can say it was phenomenal. I did it consistently for a year and a half. That is something I want to implement again because it really did go so well. Um, I mean, I remember I was sitting at a restaurant here in town and someone comes up and they're like, oh, my goodness, you're the girl from TikTok. It's like, <laughs> that's crazy. That is so awesome that people know me locally from social media. Um, or I was sit. I love like I would be out with realtors and things and they're like, 
hey, like I just watched your video that you sent out last Wednesday. That was such a great tip. Thank you so much for sharing that. People saw the videos. So social media is huge. My message to anyone asking about social media would be put a huge emphasis on it. When I got started, it honestly wasn't as big as it is even now. Um, back in 2016, people used Facebook. Instagram was a lot younger. Pop now there's a lot more people on there, but it was a lot more young. So I was like, not really interested in that. I did more on Facebook. Now I do YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, everything. Um, however, if I could point one, you know, one area in my business that I would like to improve, that would definitely be one of them to do more of it because I just think it's it's so important nowadays. And I've seen so many Asians, they build their business off of, you know, their Instagram, their TikTok account where everyone up north sees their videos and calls them to come down. And I'm a little old school that it's just to me like mind blowing that that works that way, but it does. So it, right. it'd be, you know, me saying how well door knocking works. Someone could sit here and say the same thing about social media. For sure. Yeah, that's definitely neat that, you know, I'm sure for some time you're jumping into, you know, making a lot of posts and putting things online, you know, kind of wondering and expecting some sort of return on your time investment, but not quite that certain until you start having people locally come up and telling you, hey, I'm seeing the videos. Hey, appreciate you doing that. That was very, uh, you know, valuable information. And I'm sure that helps spur on, you know, even more uh, desire to do that. And, you know, just seeing the impact that it's having. Uh, what it are is generally the content that you're putting out there for homeowners specifically, people that are looking to buy, looking to sell, or do you do it all, you know, any of that for agent, you know, people that are looking to become an agent and, you know, get into real estate themselves? So it's all of those. So it's buyers, sellers, investors, and agents. So um, like I always say, if you're looking to buy a home, sell a house, invest in real estate, or start your real estate career, this is the place for you. So it, it really covers all of those. So I might put out like, now I've got Tip Tuesdays and uh, Fact Fridays, just silly things that we put out on social media. And it might be a negotiation for the agent, how to negotiate a certain thing. But keep in mind, buyers anywhere can take that to their agent and say, hey, I saw this girl say this about this certain negotiation. Would this work for us? Right. So it works for the buyers too. It works for sellers because a lot of it is about talking about the market, um, what to do in certain markets, what's going on in our market, what this means or that. So it really covers all of those. It's just all things real estate. Yep. It's neat that you've utilized it. And I think it's something that everybody can do is just set aside some time each week. I like what you've got going on, some consistent days and times of uh, content people can expect is going to come out. And yeah, you never know who's going to hear that. And and just be like, you know what, Savannah's really helped me out a lot on understanding the market. And, you know, I, I do think she's right about this is the time to sell and whatnot. Uh, you just never know the the kind of impact and the people that are going to hear, you know, some easy content to film and put online. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, so you're, you're an agent for several years. You're starting to build up your list of buyers and sellers and finding success there. What was this decision making behind starting your own brokerage and what was the process like to get that up and running? Yeah, great question. So again, takes me back to COVID. So the brokerage opened in 2020 at the very end of 2020. So COVID opened up March of 2020 here. And keep in mind, so I've been in the business at that point for four years. It was chaotic. I mean, the entire time I was in the business, I was so busy that having the opportunity to step away from your business and look at it more or less from like a management standpoint, what can I fix? What can I change? Who do I need to hire? Who do I need to fire? I did not have the opportunity um, because I was so busy, which I know is a lot of downfalls from companies is not standing back and looking at it. So I, I was well aware of that. Again, I love real estate. It is my passion. I do all things real estate. You know, I've, I've, flipped properties even on that side, purchase properties, rentals, and then I'm working with my clients as well, commercial, whatever it may be, I'm up for the challenge and I love it. As long as it has to do with real estate, I yeah. love it. So I knew at some point I would open a brokerage. So I got my broker's license in 2018 because I wanted if an opportunity to present it itself for me to already have the license and not have to go to school for it. So I got my license had it and I was like I'm ready to go when the right opportunity comes 
that might be 10 years, 20 years, or five years from now. I didn't think it was going to be two years. I can tell you that for sure. So COVID happened. COVID gave me the opportunity to step away from my business and look at it. And I just decided, I was like, at that point, I didn't know how long we were going to be on hold. And I felt like I already have my license. Let me investigate other brokerages because um, I know I want to open a brokerage at one point. I've never had the opportunity to sort of have a pause in my business until now. So I'm going to take it to see, you know, what's out there and whatnot. So I interviewed a couple different companies. I did end up going with a franchise. So, you know, I've, I've heard pros and cons going with the franchise versus not. Again, I'm in it for the long haul. So I'm in a franchise now. Doesn't mean I'll always be in a franchise. And I knew I would have that opportunity down the road. So I felt like for starting out, I want to be in a franchise because again, I have my whole business. I still sell and I've got my team. It's not like I'm putting every effort I have just towards opening a brokerage. So because of that, I wanted to have sort of a plug-in effect and go with a company that I could use a lot of um, their advice and what they've, what's worked or what they've done. So Cell State is the franchise. Vision Realty is my company. So the full entire is Cell State Vision Realty. And yeah, I interviewed them. I talked to them. I liked their systems for the agents. I liked their structure. So I decided to go ahead and, and make the leap. And it was December. We waited forever for our license to finally get through COVID. Everyone used COVID as an excuse for everything. So they said it took way long to get our license. Although I don't quite understand how COVID had anything to do with that. But yeah. it was to happen like the next day and ended up being like two and a half months that I waited. But it was December, I think it was like December 23rd. It was like a day or two before Christmas that I finally got the license. So very excited. So we officially were opened in December of 2020. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I mean, you took an opportunity of, you know, some slower time with COVID to really investigate this. Like you said, take a, a thousand foot view um, of what is going on with, with my business and my time and, you know, what is just going to make the most sense. And you did the legwork ahead of time to prepare yourself to already have the broker's license to act when the opportunity came. So there's a lot of lessons with that alone. Now, it's obviously grown, um, you know, since you've got that started a few years ago. What do you do to attract agents to your your brokerage? And, uh, you know, how much emphasis and time do you put on that versus, you know, your own team and, and your efforts there? So... You know, that's going to be different for everyone. Again, I have my full business. So in my eyes, I felt like my first year, I'm really not going to do much of anything to grow. I'm just going to have a brokerage for my business that I don't have to pay another broker or I don't have to be involved in another brokerage and I can have my team and run it and then I'll get things set in order to bring on other agents. So I did that. Um, I ended up actually, I started in 2020. So everything, when we opened in December, we were technically ready to hire someone day one because we had already had everything ready, but that wasn't really my desire. And to be honest, I still, to this day, we've got 27 agents now because we just got another two from our first conversation. Um, to this day, I haven't sat down and said, you know, this was my specific time. I'm going to call. I'm going to recruit agents. I'm going to get to meet them. I know a lot of agents in town here. So this is my local and a lot of people know me. So it's been sort of, hey, I met her. I'm interested. Savannah, can we have a conversation? That's how the agents that are here have come. Now we've opened an office in Lakewood Ranch, as you mentioned. June 1st was our first date there. That's going to be a total different story. So that is not my neck of the woods. Um, Sarasota, you know, this, this area, everybody knows me. They don't know me there. So in that location, it's going to be a lot more of sitting down daily, calling these agents, recruiting, and bringing them in. A total different business structure. Um, that will end up being a lot more time. Versus here, like I say, when it comes to the agents that have brought in, I'm not the best example to say, how did you do it? Because it was just people that knew me that sat down and met. What I will say is I've talked to a lot of people that have wanted to join the brokerage and that I've said no to. So I don't take every agent. I don't want to be the next Keller Williams with 250 agents and 50 agents leave a month because they're new agents or they don't know what they're doing or they don't want to you know, work with their broker anymore, whatever it might be. I don't want that. 
So I don't bring on, you know, any brand new agent. Um, I'll have a conversation with them. And most of the time I will refer them to a couple different people I work with that specifically work with brand new agents. So I'm more or less looking for, you know, you do about 3 million plus in sales. You're active. You're working out there. 90% of the agents do nothing. So it's only 10% doing the work. I want those 10%. I want, you know, they're, they're sharp. They know what they're doing. They know how to negotiate. Those are the ones that I want too. Mm. So I, I'm kind of picky about that as well. Yeah. And that keeps your brand and, and Vision Realty, you know, distinct and set apart so that, you know, yes, they're, they're an agent underneath that brokerage. And so they are in some way a face of, of the brand. And by you being more particular on who comes along, what that's going to do is attract other great talent in the future to want to come alongside. Because if you're just letting anybody and everybody, I'm sure you would have missed out on some of the really good agents that you got because they see the care and the time you put into being particular and picking out your people, you know, somewhat specifically. So I think that's going to pay big dividends instead of just trying to grow it as fast as possible with as many just for the sake of growth. And it, for you, do you see what what's kind of the return on your investment and the time that you take to, you know, bring on these new agents? You know, I, I just am curious from the outside looking in, not being as familiar, are you, you know, making, uh, you know, a fair amount of money through the brokerage, through some commissions, um, or it's, you know, really a super long-term play and you, you know, a lot of the money and the income still comes from your team. H how does that kind of divide up? Yeah, so you will make the most amount of money selling houses all by yourself, just you. Um, you know, maybe you have some admin, but you don't have a buyer's agent or anything. Commissions, you'll never be able to take away from that commission. That is where you're going to earn the most money. So my team for sure is what makes the most money. That is, you know, my cash cow, right? Like that is where the money comes from. And a lot of times that supports the brokerage. Now, the brokerage makes money. Definitely, it's a long term. The other thing is I've had people say, you know, I'm thinking about opening a brokerage. And I tell them, if you are not passionate about opening a brokerage, if it's just about the money, stay in sales. You will you will make more money in sales. Um, I, say, I say that to this day. I mean, we've been open now for three. I mean, we're going on our fourth year in business. And if I took my time that I was in the brokerage and just put it towards sales, you would be making more money. That said, again, long-term, brokerage-wise, it is definitely a long-term. Again, though, you know, these agents, it's not like, okay, we brought an agent on it, now they're going to stay here forever. No, so even that's not necessarily long-term. So it's a lot of work. You have to be passionate about it. Otherwise, it won't be worth it. You can't open it just because you want to make more money in real estate. If that's the case, then you need to go bring on a buyer's agent and do more sales because that's how you're going to make the most money. But that for sure is what is bringing in the most money is through that team, through the sales, my own sales, things of that nature. The brokerage does make money, but again, it's not going to be, you know, your your profit margin. Like for instance, I was doing a financial um, class the other day in going on brokerage versus a team. So a team, if we're doing, let's say, let's say you did 10 million sales last year. And based off of 10 million in sales, whatever that income is, you know, right from that income you used to be making about, I think it was like 40% of the income. So net income versus your gross income. So your net income should be about 30%, 40%, I'm sorry, of your gross income. For a brokerage, it's like four to 5%. Yeah. So it's significantly smaller. You're working with larger numbers, but it's significantly smaller. So that's why I say it's a passion. It's definitely a long term. If you're doing make money quick, get your license and go sell a whole bunch of houses. That's the fastest way you're going to make money. Brokerage is very long term. And if you don't have any sales of yourself and you want to make money from the brokerage, you really have to have 50 to 100 agents to be making enough money to make it worthwhile. Otherwise, you know, I've got 25 agents that do a fantastic job, um, but I'm still I still have my team. Absolutely. Makes sense. And and speaking of long term, I know you had mentioned it a little bit earlier, but do you uh, what what investment properties do you have personally? Um, and is that something that you have a big emphasis on and focus of? I want to to grow in owning my own properties and grow a portfolio there, 
or is that something that you know happens occasionally? Um, and and the t- you know your real estate brokerage and team is your main focus. What what uh, are you invested in on that side? Main focus is for sure the brokerage and the team. Um, buying houses on the side is exactly what that is. So when you're in real estate, in you're in real estate as well, so you understand. You know, deals come your way. You hear things, and stuff comes up. You, whatever it might be, that you're just like, well, of course I'm going to buy it. Why wouldn't I? So it just kind of happens. I would say I buy about two houses, two to three houses a year. So yes, definitely growing the rental portfolio. Most of those are all turning into rentals, whether it's a duplex or a house, turn them into rentals. What I have found is I really like my new builds because I don't have to do anything to them and they rent out and people are excited to have a brand new build. So, but that said, yeah, that's just a couple a year and it's more or less, hey, you know, it helps me with my taxes and we're building a rental portfolio, sort of a side income. Um, Aside from that, I also love to flip houses. That is also very much a side. I might do one to two of those a year too. Something comes up, you know, someone calls you. They say, hey, I want to get out of my house. I need a cash offer and I want to leave this week. Well, give them a cash offer. You would be surprised. I just did one recently and I'm looking at the numbers and I'm like, I mean, I got to give this guy X number and it's probably not what he wants to hear. You never know because I I bring it to him and I say, hey, listen, if you really do want to get out this week and you want a cash offer, this is what I can give you. But that's all I can do. That's that's the max I can do. Okay, I'll take it. I want to be out. I'll take it. All right, perfect. He's happy. He's moving. You just got a great flip property. Guess what? You're an agent. Flip it. Sell it. Make money. Now go do a 1031 tax exchange and go buy some more houses. Exactly. So that's how I do it. Any of my flips, I always do a 1031 tax exchange and I buy properties from it. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times that's really a completely different business um, because a lot of my flips have purchased my rental properties. Mm-hmm. I like that. And I think you're doing it exactly, you know, the way it's going to be best to be done as far as you've got your focus, you know, this is your bread and butter of, of building up your team and the brokerage and, and handling retail sales uh, uh, in real estate. And then just by naturally being in the industry, you're going to have some really great deals come along that it's just, you know, impossible to say no to. And, you know, you, a good deal is a good deal. So you can do a lot of things with it. It sounds like some you're going to uh, just go ahead and flip, others you'll hold on to. And that'll add up over time and, and also be something that, you know, you look back in, in 10 years and yeah, there's 20, 30 houses um, renovated, renting and, and, and making you some money. So it's just a good consequence of being in the business and again, utilizing your connections well and just all the resources that you have. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Well, for on the, you know, retail side, you've got a lot of uh, home buyers and home sellers. Have you gotten connected with um, on the investment property side, as far as connecting with um, investors, people that are looking to do house flips and rental properties of their own, even apartments and and larger properties, uh, what what does that look like for your business? Yeah, same thing. You know, that's why I love real estate is it can take different turns. So I've got quite a few investors that I work with, and it's just a matter of finding them a deal and they'll buy it, and it works out really great. My brother. Here's a plug for him, a ready construction. He owns his own construction company. So I'll find a flip property and I'll call my investor and say, hey, listen, you can pick this up for $200,000. You're going to put $100,000 into it and I'm going to list it for six hundred. dollars And after everything's all said and done, you're going to make $250,000. Do you want to buy this house? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right? You know, they're like, um, yes, send me the contract. Okay, perfect. Um, there's a lot of times they don't even see the property. So I send him the contract, I get another contract, negotiate it, have everything done. I have my brother, A. Reagan Construction. I have his company come out. His name is Andrew. Not A. Reagan Construction, but I have him come out, give me a quote. He does all of the work. I know him. He does a phenomenal job. So I don't have to worry about subs and all of that. Does all the work. I call my investor back and I say, hey, the house is done. Here's the photos. We're going to put a sign in the yard and list it for this. And then we sell it and he gets a check. So- Right. Obviously, that makes it sound super smooth and easy, but sometimes it honestly is that easy. So it's, we just did one the other day, and it was a month and a half was the turnaround time. And the profit margin on that one was 85, I think. Yeah. So 
I mean, who's going to complain about that? And also the price point was low anyway. So, I mean, the total price was, uh, what was it? Like, I think it ended up being like 200000 or less that they had mm. capital that they had to put out to get that kind of return. That's that's great numbers. So um, it, they don't all work that way, but a lot of them can be that smooth. And yeah, so I do work with them. So that's a matter of just putting the time there. You know, I've said before, I would love to have someone who finds those deals because I have the people that will purchase them. So it's just a matter of, you know, allotting that time and saying, go through the deals are on the MLS too. So finding them on the MLS, wherever they might be, find them, take them to your investors. And that will naturally build up too. I did not go specifically and look for investors. But when you're in the business, just like you purchase your houses, when you're in the business, you're doing it on the day to day, you meet people every single day that are in this sphere. Naturally, you're going to find investors that are looking to purchase and want a deal. So yeah, so that's really just happened that I've got all those investors together. That's awesome. Yeah, you're naturally uh, at, you know, attracting those types of people when they see the success in these other parts of your, your business. And you know, you're just going to utilize those connections and uh, make win win scenarios, like you said, for yourself, for that investor, for you know the construction team, everybody involved. Uh, I wanted to ask about kind of you know the current and future of of your companies. You know, what do goals look like for you? Uh, do you have maybe uh, you know inside of like okay, in five years or less, this is where I'd like us to be. Uh, go go into that of kind of what what you're looking to accomplish here in the future. So my goals are we just opened up the Lakewood Ranch office. So I want to have 25 agents there next year as well. So that way we've got a very functioning office with agents. And I'm very excited about that office. But And then I want to grow the Punta Board office to continue to grow that. So we'll probably have about another 10 agents here is where the goal is. It's nothing, you know, long-term goals. It's nothing crazy. My crazy goals have been for the last eight years in real estate. <laughs> So yeah. I have set, you know, these insane goals and I have I have worked a lot. So, um, you know, I'm getting married this year. So I'm, I'm looking at those goals saying, OK, I no longer need to be a 10 in what I work. But now my goals are changing up. How can I still be a 10 and not have to pour all of my time into this? Mm. So that's how I would say it's been unique. I've been working on it's October, well, it's almost October. So you should be working on your 2024 goals in October. So especially in real estate, because it's how our sales work. So sitting down, working on these goals, and that's really where my mindset has changed is how can I get some of my time back and yet still hit all of these goals? So, so that's where it is. So it's continuing to grow the team to where they don't need me as much. And yet they're still growing in sales. We want to do 35 million next year in sales. So we're growing in sales just on the team level continuing growing with the staff to where they don't need me as much on the brokerage level. We've got two brokerages. We'll probably open another brokerage in the middle of them. So like five-year goal would be to have that one opened, fully functioning, and um, and then really grow that Lakewood Ranch office, which is the new office that we have. So, mm -hmm. But like I say, yeah, it's, it's growing everything and continuing to do what we're doing, but at the same time, get my time back. Whereas I, I really have worked for the last eight years that I've been in real estate. I, I have worked a lot. So now it's saying, okay, let's kind of refocus this on how can we get time back, but yet still, you know, bring all this to the table. So. Absolutely. No, like, like I said earlier, you set yourself in a position where you have that option of stabilizing, making sure that the team, that the brokerage is going to be great for years and years to come. And yeah, you can put yourself in that spot of, I can be as invested as I want to be with this time, but what would it maybe look like for me to pull back some of that and uh, still, you know, crush it and, and reach new goals and new heights and the amount of sales that we're doing. So I'm, I'm excited for you all in that. And moving um, into this later part of our show, I want to ask you the four questions I ask each guest. And so uh, let's just just jump right into the first one here, Savannah. Uh, what is one of the best pieces of advice that you have been given? Best pieces of advice? Oh, you know, I would say probably, um, you know, I remember my dad always told us growing up, nobody owes you anything. That's one that always sticks in my mind is don't have a mentality that you're owed anything. You know, you work hard 
for what you have and don't have that mentality. I think agents get in the business and they think, you know, oh, it's just going to come my way and this is going to happen and that. It's not. And, you know, well, they should have given me that sale because that was my best friend. No, nobody owes you anything. Dad used to tell us that all the time growing up. Nobody owes you anything. Yeah. And then the other one is, I don't remember how it was said, but it's just, you know, you get what you work for, right? That would be another one is don't expect to, it kind of correlates with that, but don't expect to go take off in this business if you're not working extremely hard. Um, it's always irritating to me when people walk in my office or call me and they're just like, so what's the magic secret? And it's like, mm. there is no magic secret. It's working hard. And then they kind of feel like, oh, like, you know, she didn't tell me what I wanted to hear or she doesn't want to talk to me or no, it's that you don't want to hear what I have to say. So there's no magic secret. It's working hard. Nobody owes you anything. You don't just get it because you think you deserve it. You have to work hard to earn it. So those those are the pieces I would say. Yeah, I, I like that. The, the magic secret really is that if you want to be in a certain position and, you know, do a certain amount of deals or whatever it is, you can get there. But it's just going to take what you said is that consistency, not expecting anything, but going out there and earning it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I would say is this isn't necessarily a specific piece of advice. But so, you know, I had mentioned before, you know, my dad's a pastor. So I, I'm a Christian and I feel like everything is about being Christ-like as well. So I know everyone's going to be different on that, but that's just like a general piece of advice of how I was raised and how I bring that into my business. But that is also so important is you're, you treat everyone good and what goes around comes around. And I feel like, you know, I, I honestly feel like Christ has honored my business so much because of the importance you put on that. So that's another thing I see constantly is, you know, we're in sales. So sales isn't always, you know, everyone's my best friend. Well, no, they're not. They're negotiating on the other deal on the other side. So you can still be friends, but you know, th this is, this is war, right? <laughs> but still doing it correctly and not ev everything does come back to you. And I like that to me is more just like a general and not necessarily a certain piece of advice, but it's how I was raised. It's what I brought into my business that I still feel like is very important. And I feel like Christ honors that when you do your business that way. I feel like that is honored and that's also very important. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, as a follower of Christ myself, the just following that golden rule of treating others the way you'd want to be treated and honoring and respecting them in all these business transactions is, is going to go a long ways. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. No, the second one, what is one of your favorite business books? Oh, favorite business books. So Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That is such a good book. I've read that multiple times. Um, there's so much, I mean, there's so much knowledge in that book on 1031 tax exchange with your taxes, how to save money. Anyone in real estate, I tell them, this isn't going to teach you how to sell a house, but it will teach you how to handle your money. I feel like that book is really, really good. Um, the other one that I thought of that is really good too is um, how to, um, I think it's how to win friends and influence people. Yeah. It, it's yeah. like, Dale it's Carnegie. Just, I'm pretty sure that book, oh, both of those books are the two books that I suggest for all of my agents to read right away. Ask them, read these two books. And neither one of them are going to tell you how to sell a house, but read these two books. Um, how to win friends and influence people, maybe, because that is so huge, especially in our business. That kind of correlates to what we were just talking about, how you treat people, how important that is. That book teaches you how to get what you want from people with them feeling like you just poured into them. So I, I love that book. Both of those are really good books. They are. Both of those are huge. And, I, you know, I think they should be curriculum in schools or something because they, they just go over yes. the basics that people need to know. They really do. All right. Well, number three, then, what is one character trait you notice that successful people commonly share? I would say consistency, yeah. just continuing to do the same thing. And I'm always challenged when I hear, you know, every morning they wake up at the same time and they're doing this, this and that. And they've been doing the same thing for a long time and they continue to do it. Right. Right. I am absolutely in agreement there. And then the last is simply where can people connect with you? I know we talked about some content and such, but what would be the best way there for people to reach out or to look at what you've got going on? 
Yeah. So I have, if you look up Savannah Shepherd or Savvy Realtors online or Vision Realty, all of these things will come up. But I have um, a website, I have an Instagram, a TikTok, a Facebook, all of that information. So my Facebook is Savannah Shepherd. And then um, my business page is, you know, just Savannah Shepherd, um, Savvy Realtors is like the, and then Savannah, Savannah, no, I'm sorry, Realtor Savannah Shepherd is my Instagram. So if you do, if you have Instagram, I would say go there because you can just type in Realtor Savannah Shepherd as my handler. And then you'll be able to see my link tree on there and all of my other accounts are on there. So then you can kind of see everything from there. Otherwise, most things you just type in my name, it'll pop up. YouTube, things of that nature, it's going to go ahead and just pop up for you. Very nice. And we'll leave links to all of those in the show notes and description so you guys can check out her different profiles there. But uh, yeah, Savannah, thank you so much for coming on. Very insightful. I learned a lot uh, just even on the brokerages and some of the pros and cons and such and just hearing your story has been great. So thank you for taking the time today. You're welcome. It's an honor to be asked. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all for tuning into this episode of the Growth Circle podcast. If you found value from it like I did, please leave us a five-star rating and we will catch you on the next one. Thanks.